What's up guys, welcome to Psychology of Spirituality, Saeed here. Really excited to start this new series where I'll be delving into different therapy, therapeutic models. Many of you may be familiar with CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. There are also many other ones and I want to use this platform as a way to educate you guys on different therapies, you know, because each of them are really interesting. Each of them are built on different uh, theoretical orientations and different research. So with that, I want to start off with rational emotive therapy because I just finished a book called A Guide to Rational Living which is right here uh, by Albert Ellis and the fundamental piece in this therapeutic is the cognitive shift. So we all have erroneous uh, disastrous beliefs that we have for the different situations we are in, the different relationships we're in, for our perception of the world and the rational emotive therapy R-E-T uh, tackles these disturbances and seeks to change them so with that, I'm going to go into uh, this book, A Guide to the Living, and he outlines the 10 beliefs that we hold as human beings that don't make any sense. And he puts these as the core for many of the mental health disturbances that we have. And he also provides solutions for what, for what we can do to, uh, like I said, change these beliefs. So with that, I'm going to go through each of these 10 and provide solutions for you guys. Number one. The idea that it is a dire necessity for us as adults to be loved or be adored or be approved by almost everyone for, for virtually everything we do. Some sense of how we're being perceived is normal, right? But we have to really understand whether this constant need for approval is masking deep sense of worthlessness that we feel for ourselves. And there's a really, really cool quote in the Bhagavad Gita that says, the strongest individual is one who is indifferent to honor and insult, indifferent to heat and cold, indifferent to pleasure and pain. He who is free from attachment. So again, that's a hard level to get us, to get ourselves to, but you know, it's an it's a interesting guiding principle that we can use. Uh, and the solution to this is cultivate love towards oneself, right? Because as I talked about in many of my previous videos, the constant projection that we put onto others, it's taking away from those cultivating aspects we can use for ourselves. So focusing on hobbies, interests, ideas, peoples that are different from our own. You know? Number two, the idea that one should be thoroughly competent, adequate, and achieving in all possible respects. This is really important. Achievement is not and should not be tied to what our intrinsic worth is as human beings. This is vital to instantiate in our philosophies because we live in a meritocratic society. Meritocratic. This means that success and the way we judge success is almost entirely measured on what we can achieve extrinsically. We know that, you know. And there's research that I'm linking that correlates the rate, the right, the raise, the rate of materialism and living in the in Western nations, and it's much higher than in other parts of the world. This is the reason that pride is one of the seven deadliest sins. And you know, I talk a lot about religion in this uh, YouTube channel, but I try to look at it from a psychological lens, not a theological lens, right? From a psychological level, pride, perfectionism need for perfectionism is one of the most salient risk factors for mental health disorders. Uh, we should never hold ourselves to immeasurable standards. And you know, this is a guiding principle that we should have. So that's number two. So number three, the idea that certain people are bad, wicked, evil, villainous, and that they should be blamed and punished for that. So this links to a video that I made two to, uh, two to three weeks ago in understanding the systematic pressures of bad behavior and evil, which I'm linking right here. Bad behavior is usually caused by systematic forces and bad behavior doesn't ever mean that the individual is holistically bad, right? Uh, this is a thematic concept in all the world's religions actually, right? Most great movies have this as the arc of their plot line. Redemption, right? We want to see people redeem themselves. Uh, Non-judgment, empathy are the solution to this. Uh, it's also a way for us to understand that we also are possible of committing horrors and atrocities, right? Hold people responsible, but still be compassionate towards them. So that's number three. Number four, this one's important. The idea that it is terrible, horrible, and catastrophic when things are not going the way we would like them to go. I hear this all the time in therapy. And this is especially relevant with today's pandemic situation going on. 
To put it simply, whether you like it or not, this is the reality of the world and you cannot change it, right? And I'm linking an acceptance of the present moment meditation that I did to help you realize, if you haven't done so, that the stress that you may be feeling for these circumstances we cannot change, it's crippling you. This stress, you can reformat it. You can do some like spiritual alchemy and you can reformat it as wisdom and growth for you to learn from this situation. Number five, the idea that human unhappiness is externally caused and that humans have little or no ability to control their sorrows or negative feelings. I'm linking a lecture that I did at a psychology conference where I talk about the hedonistic treadmill, or sometimes it's called the happiness treadmill. Uh, This is a well-researched psychological phenomena that shows that by and large, individuals who go through extremely positive or negative circumstances. I'm talking about research done on people who have won the lottery, research on people who have gone through uh, extreme car accidents, who've lost limbs. Research has shown that after a few months, after they adjust to their life situation, they return back to their baseline levels of happiness. Uh, And I love this quote from the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. Knowing others is intelligence. Knowing yourself is true wisdom. Mastering others is strength. Mastering yourself is true power. So we can use that. That's number five. Number six. The idea that if something is or may be dangerous or fearsome, one should be terribly occupied with and upset about it. Um, This is a really funny quote that Albert Ellis uses in this book. Probably 98% of what we call anxiety in modern life is a little more than over-concern for what someone thinks about you. This is needless fear. Right? It's not worth our mental energy in our perception amongst other people who, to put it bluntly, are just background characters in the stories of our life. Right? Number seven, the idea that it is easier to avoid facing many, life, many of life's difficulties and self-responsibilities than to undertake more rewarding forms of self-discipline. As I talked about delayed gratification, I'm linking some videos that I did on that. By and large, human beings we don't do a cost-benefit analysis of our past, present, and future. We're really good at thinking of the short-term results and consequences. What that does is it impairs our future self, right? It's hard for us to think about that. You know, just set small, manageable goals. A lot of what therapy is, is taking really large problems that have consumed people and breaking it up into tiny, manageable goals that you can do in a day. I can't do it in a day. Okay, how much time can you allocate in a couple of hours five minutes okay this huge problem we're going to break it down into five minute increments and see how much you can do right that's a lot of what therapy is right so that's number seven number eight the idea that the past is all important and that because something once strongly affected our life it should indefinitely do so again it's important to understand that there are many different therapeutic models some pay much more attention to our past as a place to find growth right some of the freudian therapies some of the jungian therapies uh, those even go into our unconscious our dreams right but some of them really go into our past uh, and others are much more focused on the present much less focused on the why and more focused on the how why did this happen why am i like this that doesn't matter how can i change myself How can I better myself? Let's focus on that. We usually attribute bad behavior to like something terrible that happened in someone's past. And our movies often show this type of stuff. Batman, which I just talked about. Uh, And this is usually not the case, right? And the the statistics bear that out. Most mental health disorders aren't a result of like a childhood trauma or anything like that, right? Again, environmental circumstances are very important. So if anything comes through from this video, broadening our understanding of mental health from an individual level to a societal to a countrywide to a macro level okay so that's number eight number nine the idea that people and things should be different from the way they are and that it is terrible if perfect solutions are not immediately found yes we should expect a certain set of principles from those close to us and those that we want to let into our lives but being overly occupied with how others behave takes away from our behavior and from what we can actually control, which is us. You should have a core set of values that you expect from someone. And if that person doesn't reach that threshold, then that person's not worth having in your life, you know? It's hard because 
attraction is so much, it's so emotional and using the intellectual uh, tools to try and, uh, you know, bypass some of these things is hard. But that's why you, that's why you have a strong set of people around you, you know, people you can refer to. You need that, you know. It's not worth having weak friends. You need to have a strong set of friends who can support you in places where your emotion may, may cloud your judgment. Okay, so that's number nine. Number 10, the last Albert Ellis rational emotive therapy point, uh, the idea that maximum human happiness or well-being can be achieved by inaction or by being passive or by simply living to enjoy oneself. I have talked about that last point at length, the fundamental difference in how we approach existence and living well. This is actually the topic of my dissertation. Um, how do we conceptualize living well, right? There are many different worldviews. Is living well engaging in unlimited pleasure, right? That's called hedonism. Uh, do we show restraint? Some of the Stoics would say yes, you show self-discipline. Um, do we submit to something higher than ourselves? You know, lots of the transcendent uh, spiritual philosophies, the transcendental philosophies would say yes, you have to submit to something higher than yourself so you don't degrade your of what you can do in base pleasures, right? Actualizing one's potentials, dedication to a task, self-mastery, intrinsic motivations and desires, passion, cultivating ourselves, these are all correlated with life satisfaction, with pro-social behaviors, with uh, increased mental health, right? So it's important for us to cultivate a strength, a passion. And I'm also conscientious of the fact that this is a luxury to some people than it is more to others. There are many people who, because of life, are not able to, uh, you know, find a hobby and master it and go travel the world, you know? But honestly, I mean, some of the most dedicated, passionate people that I've seen are single mothers who are putting themselves through college, fathers who are working three or four jobs, who think about their children, they show me their pictures of the children on their phone as a guiding principle for them to maintain the fire in their uh, stomach, you know, to keep them motivated and fueled, you know? So that passion, that life, that energy, you know, that's what, that's what existence is all about. And if you can find that, you'll be a much happier, well-rounded person. Um, so that's rational emotive therapy. This is the first therapeutic model, and I'll be going through many, many different ones. Let me know what you thought about that form of therapy. Can you see yourself engaging in a, in a therapeutic session with someone who practices this model? Um, me, I like taking from a bunch of different ones. Uh, and it'll be a surprise for you, the next one that I pick. I have lots of the different ones in my mind. Um, and I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. And I'll see you on the next episode. Thank you.